Hi, everyone. It's good to see everyone. So, um, as Stron said, I want to talk about we can heal ourselves and the planet. The main focus originally was we can heal the planet. But in order to heal the planet, we have to heal ourselves. So this is our starting point. And in the next one, we'll talk more directly about healing the planet because there's a lot of concern about what's going on with the planet and what we can do to help improve things. And a lot of the things um, uh, don't go along with my common sense or intuition or sensibilities in, in most any way. So I'm gonna start off a place years ago Around the time that um, I wrote my first book, I decided, made a conscious decision to not try to document anything that I said scientifically for two reasons. One, others can do it far better than I can. But more importantly, I wanted to speak in terms of common sense because common sense is a universal language. It passed the test of time and it's cross-cultural. For example, Ben Franklin said, a stitch in time saves nine. Take care of things when they're small or take care of things early. That's a kind of universal truth. Every, everyone knows that, you know, that, that that's a reality. So, and the second reason that I'm, I'm coming back to this is I'm very alarmed by hearing again and again, follow the science because the interpretation of follow the science is trust your doctor or trust the authorities. It has nothing to do with science. And if you question these authorities, these so-called experts, then you're called an anti-vaxxer or a denialist or a conspiracy theorist. In other words, you're basically dismissed which is 100% opposite of science, which is about questioning, right? To see if it's real and see if we can reproduce that um, idea again and again. So what people are referring to as science in many ways and saying, trust the science, follow me, I don't find to be science at all. And I've, I find that very alarming because we're giving up our power. No. So, to me, common sense and intuition always come before science. I'm not saying there's not valid and good science. There's plenty out there, but we're not seeing as much of it these days. And we really need our common sense and intuition to know what to investigate, what to look at. So I'm going back to that thing that I came up with many years ago, and I'll probably use this introduction to everything I say because I feel so, so strongly about that. I think it's such an important point. And together with that, our modern education is basically creating fear, deep fear about so many things. And fear is the enemy of common sense and intuition. When we're fearful, we lose our sensibility and, we, and our intuition becomes blocked. So um, I think we need to get back to just some basics that people have lived by for thousands of years successfully. And as I said, they passed the test of time. Now, George Osawa, the founder of modern day macrobiotics was interested much more in world peace than he was in health. However, his idea on how to create world peace was through individual health and happiness. So creating a peaceful biological revolution where each one of us transforms ourselves from within then we create healthy, happy families, societies, and eventually the world. So again, the, the key to healing the planet is healing ourselves. And because we are a reflection of each other, we can't separate ourselves. George Osawa's basic idea that he you know, created macrobiotics on was the idea of Japanese concept Shindo Fuji. The body and the earth are not two. From my reinterpretation, we are one and inseparable, inseparable from nature and the environment. We can't separate ourselves from the environment. So when we see an unhealthy planet, what we're really seeing is a collection of unhealthy people. And 
you don't have to be an epidemiologist or scientist to look around and see 40 some percent of people in this country are obese. Over 70% are overweight or obese. You know, everyone has more than one degenerative illness, heart disease, cancer, immune problems, you know, it's a mental illness, which have only become compounded greatly in, in the last couple of years. So our increasing degree of unhealthiness naturally is reflecting in a healthy planet because health craves health. Healthy people like healthy things around them. Healthy people want healthy foods. They want healthy friends. They have healthy activities, every aspect. So when we ourselves are healthy, we create health around us. Okay. So the focus needs to be on ourselves. Next, we are self-healing, self-repairing beings. Our body is trying to rebalance and repair at every moment of our life from the second we take our, our first breath and even it's in the womb. If you cut yourself, it starts to repair instantly. If you bruise yourself, if you don't feel well, if, if somebody insults you, whatever, the healing process is constantly going on, always trying to take place and it never stops. So if that's so, if we're self-healing beings, how do we get sick? We shouldn't get sick. Well, it's, it's, it's basically simple for two reasons. First, we really don't understand enough about health, about diet and health, about what creates health. There's no education. You know, in school, we learn how to fit in society. We don't learn about how to be healthy. Unless we come from a healthy family or we're lucky enough to discover macrobiotics, we, we really don't have the basic understanding of diet and health. More importantly, we poison ourselves. We are continually poisoning ourselves. So more than 70% of our food is GMO food, genetically modified organisms. Glyphosate is everywhere, including in you know babies in the wombs. Glyphosate is destroying the planet, it's destroying our microbiome, the seat of, of, of our health. 70% of our food is highly ultra processed food. We have no idea what we're eating. Healthy food, you read the ingredients. Brown rice, one ingredient. Unyeasted sourdough bread. Flour, salt, water, and sourdough starter. Healthy food, you can identify what it is. Now you look on a label, so you read labels. I don't know what I'm reading. 95% of things, I have no idea. You know, when we started a scene, we had a distribution company for a few years. At that time, you had, a, there was a minimum size font in which you had to put the ingredients of the food and they all had to be on the label. So at that time, in the early 70s, you had to list all the ingredients in a form that was readable. Well, now you need a magnifying glass and sometimes with the magnifying glass, it's still hard. And, you know, at my age, my eyes are, are still pretty good. I, I, I must say, I'm not, not, not bragging, but I'm, you know, touch what I'm, I'm happy. And a lot of things I can read, but, but I, I see those labels, this is ridiculous. Okay, so it, it's not food. The next, we're eating factory farmed animal and dairy food if we're eating animal food. Animals that are raised deplorably, they're poisoned in, in every possible way and, and mistreated. Then two other things, bad quality oils from the late 1800s when they tried to replace fat, lard with vegetable oil. So Procter & Gamble started to refine oils and everybody remembers Crisco, but we came up with, with cottonseed oil and canola oil and corn oil and soy oil and peanut. And these oils are highly, highly toxic. They're very different from the traditional unrefined organic sesame oil we use and organic extra virgin olive oil, the only two really traditional oils on the planet. These oils are highly inflammatory and they're behind a lot of diseases, together, including obesity. And together with that, in the mid-60s, when uh, 
the food companies changed to high fructose corn syrup, changed from sugar to high fructose corn syrup because it was cheaper, then that combination of bad oil or dairy and fructose is basically destroying everyone's immune system. So basically, we are poisoning ourselves. Then in addition to that, we lead unbelievably sedentary lives. I saw this documentary recently, and I, a couple of things caught my attention. So in the 1800s, we spent 50% of our time outdoors. Half our life. Well, it was an agrarian society. In the 1950s, when I grew up, 25%. Okay, because I mean, my recollection is everybody's outside, you know, not all the time, but lots, not only kids, but adults as well. Now, 7%. Now, that's the average. I mean, some people are now 15%, and other people are out 1% or none, you know. So we do not have exposure to natural light and the sun. And I'll talk more about that next time. Then we're exposed to electromagnetic fields, radio waves and blue light from computer screens, from TVs, from cell phones. All these things are poisoning us on different levels and literally contributing to, to our sickness. And now with 5G, they've really stepped up the electromagnetic uh, fields greatly, greatly in such harmful ways. And we're gonna see, and it's interesting, they rolled out, uh, 5G at the very beginning of COVID. And all the rollout cities had the highest levels of COVID, interestingly enough. Milan was a big one. We were there at, in the beginning. And I checked with my friend Martin. I, I said, how extensive is 5G there? And after we got back, he said, yeah, 5G is, is really big here. Um, but at any rate, um, then, okay. What can we learn from long lasting tr traditional cultures, civilizations, because there was a similar pattern and they all had a high degree of health and longevity. So what did they do that was common? They had a similar pattern of, to their diet and lifestyle everywhere in the world. It's, it's, it's pretty much, it's almost exactly the same. Few variations, but mainly it's the same. The diet was based on grains, beans, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and fruits, naturally fermented foods, naturally preserved foods, mild beverages, like herbal teas, and mild sweeteners, right? Date, date sugar, rice syrup, maple syrup, mild sweeteners, not like we have now. This is the same pattern everywhere with one exception. Japan added two things to that mix. Soy products, which are also under attack, which I'll talk about next time, and seaweeds, both which are unique and also make it much easier to be a vegan macrobiotic if, if that's how you choose. So this was the, the pattern that was enjoyed, practiced throughout the world for thousands of years, but also in addition, regular meals and an orderly life. So there was a rhythm to life. So people lived, especially for the industrial revolution, according to nature. Um, you know, when I lived in Japan, basically it closed at, at 10 p.m. Uh, there were very few places open after at that time. It was still much more of a you know, a natural schedule to, to life, then strong social connections with strong social activity. Then they all had holidays, celebrations, and traditions. And all these things are, are disappearing, and especially in the last two years, so many people are isolated socially. And holidays are not the same anymore. Then they also had active lifestyles in contact with nature. But there was one other really important point. They all had respect for and tried to preserve nature and the environment. One of my early influences in macrobiotics was a book published by Rodale Press called Farmers of 40 Centuries. Now in China over a 4,000 year period with very limited 
arable land and a large population, not only did they preserve the soil and environment, but they enhanced it. They built it up over the millennia. So in a couple hundred short years, we're destroying large, large tracts of our environment, and they kept their environment sacred and healthy for over 4,000 years. I bet they're not doing it today. I mean, pollution is, is horrible there, but, but but they did. But this is common. All traditional people, they, they had respect for nature and the environment, and they did the best to protect it because they had the intuitive understanding that it's the same, the environment is us. That without a healthy environment, there's no healthy people. It's simply that. So, okay. The next important thing, and it's really important, it's health craves health. In other words, you eat one healthy thing, you want another healthy thing. You eat healthy food, you want a healthy environment. A healthy environment, you want healthy activity. One thing leads to another. When we start to move in the direction of health, we crave health. But then something else, which is very important, starts to develop. And that is health intuition. We start to crave what we really need for our health. So one of my longtime observations in macrobiotics is imbalances perpetuate themselves. Once we get imbalanced, we start to crave our worst foods more and more over time. So someone comes to see me for calcium, they have a serious problem. I'll say, avoid this, that, that, and that. They say, that's my whole diet, right? How, how could I have a diet based on all my worst foods? I said, well, every, everyone does that. The more we get away from health, the more we crave our worst foods that make us sicker and sicker. It's an automatic process until we start to take steps towards health. That's behind my seven steps, recreate a balance. Once we start to take steps towards health, then we start to crave health. We start to get healthy cravings that guide us towards health. And we start to know what we need, when we need it, and how much. So I call that health intuition. What I marvel at a lot, you know, I'm always trying to think who comes to macrobiotics? Because there's young, old, there's, you know, every ethnicity, there's every, you know, educational background, professional background. Um, the only thing I can think of is people who have a more intuitive approach to life are naturally attracted to macrobiotics. But the problem is this, most intuitive people don't use their intuition for their own health. They use it in their life, they use it for everything else. If they're healers, they use it for their clients. If they're business people, they use it for developing their business or making more money, whatever, whatever they do, because intuition works best at what you do and what you use it for. Now, intuition, some people are not intuition by nature, they're naturally intuitive. That, that, that's who they don't have to develop. It's like some people are good at math, some people are good at art, some people are naturally intuitive. But intuition is natural to healthy human life. That means we all have intuition. But we need to use and we have to look to our health intuition to learn what we need. And then the more we do that, the more it appears then the more we do that, then we can start to help other people. We start to know what they need intuitively as well. I mean, I discovered in my early days of macrobiotics, when I talked to someone, I started to think about or crave or even taste in my mouth certain foods. And I thought, I'll bet this is what they need. And when I started counseling, then I said, okay, why don't you eat that? I said, oh, hey, that seemed good. Right? That's health intuition. It works for ourselves. It works for others. Then the final point I'd, I'd like to make. Um, so intuition. Then the other thing is, if we want to be healthy, we need to live like a healthy person. A healthy person lives within nature free of fear. 
And the fear that surrounds us now, I, I find very, very disturbing. I'll talk more about it next time. We're, we're afraid of our heredity. We've got the wrong genes. We got some cancer gene that's going to make our cancer, you know, totally deadly. We're, we're afraid of germs. We're afraid of bacteria. And that fear moves us more towards sickness. So, you know, what I say all the time, where do you have the most dangerous germs on the planet? In other words, where do you get the worst infections? Well, in a hospital. Why do you get the worst infections in the hospital? Well, because they're afraid of germs and they try to sterilize everything. And by sterilizing them, they make them super germs. But if you think they're friendly, because we can't live, our microbiome, our gut, is the seed of our health. We have all kinds of things, bacteria, virus, fungi, yeast, everything in there. And our microbiome is on our palms and it's on our feet, especially. So we need bread, we stomp on grapes. And it's in our nasal passages and it's on our skin, right? So all of these things, we can't live. Our life is dependent upon these primitive organisms we call germs. So why should we be afraid of them, right? So when we have a healthy internal environment, unhealthy things can't enter. Like you decide who you're gonna let into your house and who, who you're not. It's a choice, it's, it's our choice. So then the, the last point, where does our healing ability come from? Does it come from within or does it come from without? Well, my answer is our healing ability comes from nature or God or the universe. We receive it when we're open to it. When we live like a healthy person with gratitude and appreciation, then we develop the ability to let in health. But we get healthy by aligning with nature. Now, we've come to this strange thing where nature is our enemy. We're trying to protect ourselves against nature more and more all the time. But nature is our enemy. That means we're destroying ourselves. So we have to realize our real healing ability comes from God or nature or the universe. And we accept it by being open. We allow ourselves to receive health. Because, you know, I said many times before, there's, there's an interesting pattern, like, like with Sotolaro. When he recovered, the first thing he said, macrobiotic cured me. And he was like, oh, macro. But then all of a sudden he said, God cured me. And there was his, his religion that he kept talking about. And at first, and actually Nietzsche pointed out, he said, well, he's growing, right? That's why he's saying that. He's, he's realizing uh, his consciousness is growing. And I thought, hmm, that, that's really right. So basically, nature is our guide. Nature is our model. And we get healthy by learning from, observing, and aligning with nature. So what I'm trying to say is, if we want to heal our planet, we need to heal ourselves. And we have to realize that we are one and inseparable from nature and the environment. That means we're one and inseparable from each other. That's right. So that means either we go as healthy, happy, natural human beings towards health together more and more over time, or we go towards an artificial life and become something that is unrecognizable unrecognizable to a real human being. We're, we're at those crossroads now where basically we have to choose. And the final point for questions, the future is not really decided. The future is up to us by making conscious choices and expressing ourselves openly and expressing health openly and trying to share it with as many people as we can. That, that is the only key to, to a healthy future. And I hope people take that to heart because the power of one is enormous, right? If we can realize our power. So it's time to 
start to realize that we have the ability to create change with ourselves, those around us in the environment. So if you have any questions, happy to try and answer them. Thank you. All righty, thank you so much, Jenny, for that. Um, so just as he said at this time, we will now move into our Q&A segment. And for those of you who are not familiar with how that would work, you can either send those questions directly to the chat here. I'll send a quick message just so people can you know, see where you can send a question, say hello. Um, I will also allow for individuals to be able to unmute themselves and then I'll call upon you as well too, or you can do as I see uh, Diana doing, you can also use the raise hand feature. And once again, I just ask that you just wait to be called upon just so people are not going out of order. And this is being recorded. So I just wanna just make mention um, for individuals that if you do ask a question, um, that it will appear of course on the, the recording that we have here. So if you wanna ask it out loud. So the first person I have here is Diana. Um, so Diana, feel free, you can either send that directly or you can. Hi, Danny. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you. I'm um, sometimes I wonder um, about um, the importance of buying something that's organically grown, you know, like fresh produce that's organically grown versus fresh produce that is available at the farmer's market and it's local and it's probably been picked more recently. Um, do you have any advice on that? I, I do. We buy as much as possible at the farmer's market. Some of the people we buy from are certified organic. Some of the people we don't uh, are, are not. But I always talk to them and find out their growing practices and there's something that they call integrative pest management, where they only spray if it's necessary to save the crop and something that's as safe as possible. Because organic does, doesn't mean not sprayed. It means sprayed with there's certain guidelines, what's allowed, which are becoming more broad over, over time. So I'd much rather buy food that's not strictly organic from a local grower that you can see they take great care in 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 their, in, in their food you, you know that, that comes out right away in just talking to them thank you the, intuitively that's how i felt but i wanted to check that out with yeah. you thank you so much you're welcome All right, thank you, thank you. And um, for those who are watching live on Facebook, you do have the opportunity to you know, ask a question. I'll try to go back and forth between both platforms. If you type it into the um, section where Denny appears live on Facebook, I'll, I'll try to come back to you there. So we do have some questions here in the chat. And let's see, so our next question is, how do we align with nature when nature is being extreme? In record breaking heat, cold, violent storms, et cetera? Well, it's still the same. Um, we keep a regular rising and sleeping time for health. The closer to sunrise we get up, the better. But to be practical, to be up no later than 7 a.m. and to be in bed before midnight, preferably by, by 10 p.m., ideally. So that's number one. Number two is by having regular meals because there's a reason for meal times. Breakfast is the rising of the sun, lunch is the sun is high in the sky, dinner is the setting of the sun. So basically we're eating when the sun is at extreme angles. That's the time when we have the most ability to absorb nutrition. So the most important thing is to keep a regular daily schedule. Then the next important thing to align biologically, the single most important thing is have to have is to have a grain and vegetable based diet, because grains literally communicate with heaven and earth. They have the strongest connection with nature of any food. That's why they're principal food for more than ten thousand years. But vegetables have the ability to um, communicate locally. So you have this communication between heaven and earth and then through vegetables. Another reason why local is, is better to communicate locally. So in that way, we create a much larger 
alignment than, than the chaos that, that's appearing in between that. And, you know, again, when you look around in the world, the craziness in nature is the craziness we're seeing in our society. So by, you know, living a healthy, orderly life, we're helping to bring order back to nature. All right, thank you, thank you. So taking a look here in the chats again to see what questions we have. A reminder, you can send a question directly to the chat. I'm also taking a look to see if anyone has unmuted themselves. You can either unmute yourself and I'll call on you or if you use a raise hand feature. So our next question that we have, let's see. A friend of mine was told by a homeopath that soy can make it difficult for her to absorb iron. She's anemic, an older woman, and having trouble absorbing iron. So Denny, if you have a response for that. Well, as far as I know, Traditional soy products, naturally made shoyu, natural soy sauce, miso, tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk are among the healthiest foods on the planet. And I, I just came across some recent research, which I, I, I want to share. Um, and I have a client who is afraid to eat soy and I sent that to her. Even before I read, I said, I don't know if this is good. And then she emailed me back. That really made you know a huge difference. So I, I want to share it about, um, I think it's very very unbiased research. It's not cherry picking. It's, it's looking at both sides. But uh, for absorbing iron, what we really need is green leafy vegetables. That's the single most important thing. And squeeze lemon on them sometimes. But, you know, there's a, a lot of talk about, uh, and I'll talk about next time, anti-nutrients in grains, phytic acid and, and beans, which also interferes with, with the absorption. But I, I think it's, it's actually the opposite. All right, thank you, thank you. So our next question here, all right, so you spoke about the importance of the microbiome on various parts of the body and the importance of the feet. How can we nourish the microbiome on the feet? Wait one second. Okay, yeah, oh, that's it. Um, the microbiome on the feet. Well, if you're in a place where you can walk comfortably on grass or soil, I mean, that's the, the ideal way, but the body rub, helps to activate and renew uh, the skin and also the, the microbiome. Then the other thing is natural materials. So wear pure cotton socks when, you, when you're wearing socks. And also at home, when you can, go, go barefoot. You know, your feet need to breathe the same as everything else. Like when you see healthy kids, they don't wanna wear shoes or socks, period. They want to go barefoot everywhere, right? Summer and winter, it doesn't matter. All right, thank you. All right, just taking a look here, just checking the chats, going back to the Facebook Live. Let's see. Right. Um, did anyone else have any questions? So once again, if so, you know, feel free yeah, to unmute yourself or, you know, you can use your raise hand feature. And if you've already asked a question, you still have another one, you know, feel free. Um, we do have a little time. Okay, let's see. I have a couple of questions that just came in now. How do you reduce EMFs? Well, it's not it's not easy. I mean, there are things like grounded beds and uh, you know EMF blocking paints and and curtains and things like that. But practically speaking, what we do is we turn off our uh, our Wi-Fi at night, and that alone, since I started doing it, makes a huge difference. In the last few weeks. I forgot to turn it off. Not sure what happened, but I really had crazy dreams. And my wife Susan said, I really had weird dreams last night. I said, 
I'm sorry, I think I know what it is. I forgot to turn off the Wi-Fi. So that, that that's, you know, one thing. And second, when you work at a, at a computer, you know, don't hold, don't hold, don't keep your cell phone on your body and don't put it, you know, next to your ear. When, when you talk, put it on speakerphone or, or headphones, keep it away from your body. Um, it's logarithmic, logarithmic digression. Um, the other thing is green plants. Green plants are natural buffers. The other thing is natural materials, pure cotton next to the skin or linen, things like that. And there are certain products that are said to, um, you know, cancel out the harmful effects of EMFs. And do they work or not? I really don't know. Some people swear by them. And I have a friend who's a senior design scientist at Apple. And um, he said, basically, no, they don't work. Um, he says, well, if you believe, if you believe they work, then, then use them as a response to me. But before I got my upgrade to my cell phone, you know, the 5G one, I was nervous whether I should get it or not. And I called him up. And that's what he thought. And other other generations, he said, don't bother. It's not worth it. This one, he said, by all means, because of the video and camera, so much better. So, but it's 5G. He says, it doesn't matter. Keep it on airplane mode. He said, the problem is the towers. Solver makes it doubly bad, but it's really the towers that, that are the problems. So um, it's, it's hard to, you know, shoot ourselves completely. I don't know if those products work, but the things that I mentioned, I, I think, do work. And of course, the more we, you know, are in contact with nature, the more it helps everything. All right, thank you. All right, just looking here, I have one question here in, let's see. Why do we crave what is bad for us? Well, it's because imbalances, so, you know, we say yin attracts yang and yang attracts yin. Yin changes into yang and yang attracts, changes into yin, which is true. However, at the extremes, so we have balance, we have yin and yang. Once we start to move towards yin, we automatically try to move more and more towards yin until we get to the extreme and then we flip back to the opposite. Same thing happens towards the yang side. If we're balanced, when we move away from the center, we create the center and we move back. So it depends when we lose our connection with food, nature, and the universe, we get more and more imbalanced. We start to crave our, our worst things. Why, why do we have destructive habits? Why do we go from one bad relationship to another, or one bad job to another or career? It's the same thing, imbalances, you know, and people who are successful early in life, often they just have a long string, string of successes. They they choose something good in the beginning. They just make healthy choices. Balances perpetuate themselves and imbalances perpetuate themselves. And um, it's just the way energy works. And interestingly enough, and I couldn't explain it to you, but I had a longtime friend who was a very unique physicist who I talked about in the lecture. And I said, how did you discover that? I said, I don't know, it just kind of appeared to me. He said, well, that's called negative feedback theory. And it's the principle beside, behind building um, helicopters. That's how, you, how they keep them stable. So that's not only a philosophical principle, it's a principle in physics. So, um, but it's my observation, you know, I'm fascinated by patterns. And it's been my observation for, you know, nearly 50 years now. And I'm just amazed at how it's all pervasive in everything in life. All right, thank you. Um, to answer your question, Carol, if it's on airplane mode, your phone would not be able to ring. So it's, if you're looking for a call, you would have to have it off of airplane mode. So not when you're you need it for important things at the time. Did you have another question? I saw that you unmuted yourself. Carol, practice. 
maybe not. Um, oh. It was it was just concentrating. So when does it go in airplane mode? Because you do want it to ring. So I don't understand exactly. Well, I don't want my phone to ring most of the time. So oh. it's it's not a problem. And uh, I don't carry it in my pocket anymore. I no. I man by to carry it. So when you need, to, if you're expecting a call, as Teron said, or if you want to make a call, right, or you want to, you know, check something out, then you can take it off. But you know, the more you limit your exposure, the better off you're going to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to have an electrician turn off the the power for the Wi-Fi. It's some switch or something you have to put on no i just there's the router i just i just pulled the plug oh yeah I can do it through an app but i i've never figured that out so i just i just unplug it okay the the the, the what do you call it? way unplug yeah. it at night and plug it in, in the morning it's most harmful at night when we're sleeping yeah it and that's the what do you call that thing we unplug i guess it's a router yeah router okay got it yeah, thank yeah, there, you. There's some tutorials if you need to look online that may be able to help you with that specific thing. Um, yeah, great. Maybe, maybe you'd consider um, your son's lecture again at some point because it was a good lecture your son gave. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's studied those things a lot. Mm. Well, Denny, did you have that? Let me see really quickly here. Well, I like this question. So let me, um, this will be our final question. And then Denny, let me know if you have anything else that you have to share before I close. Is there a way, is there a way or practice that you use to express gratitude and to make it part of your daily life? I, I don't have a specific practice. It's something that I start every day with and end, end every day with. Um, but it's just my own, you know, ex expression. I, it's I don't have any formal method for for doing it. But you know, one of the things I realized, and I said in previous things, I I think it's very important to reestablish our connections to nature and the universe every day, because you know, there's so many influences trying to, you know also away from, from a natural path. So I think we really have to realign and reconnect and re-acknowledge our connection to food, to our loved ones and fellow human beings, to nature, to the environment, and to God every day. I think we have to consciously renew and reinforce these connections, right? In, in order to maintain a healthy, happy direction in life. And when we do that, it really strengthens. And we do it day by day. It definitely strengthens our, our connection, our resolve, our, our clarity. I mean, I, I think it's it's an amazingly simple, but you know, powerful practice. I don't know if you call it a health practice, spiritual practice, but I've, I, I find, found it to be very valuable in, in my life. And um, I, I think, you know, if, if you try it, it's just very simple and you express those things in your own way, it's up to you. All righty, thank you, thank you. Um, Denny, did you have any closing comments? If not, I'm just gonna go right into my close. Yeah, just my, my usual when I see some faces or some names I don't rec recognize, if you don't have our book, The Ultimate Guide to Eating for Longevity, it's a handbook for, for health. It's a roadmap to health as simple and as practical and as complete as, as I could make it. So hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Teron. And I hope to see you for, for, for part two.
Um, I just always have to remind individuals um, that anything that was said during this webinar, as I mentioned in the very beginning to those who missed this, um, is just for your own personal information to take away. It's no way, shape, or form medical advice or consultation. Um, I also want to let everyone know that if you missed this or you want to be able to rewatch this, it's going to presently be, this webinar will already be on Facebook if you follow Denny's professional page. If you're not on Facebook, this recording will be available tomorrow, um, probably about some time in the afternoon. Um, and also, too, I just want to just make sure that everyone knows different ways that they can stay connected. We do have different newsletters and different information outlets that you're able to subscribe to, whether it's the SHI or Denny's newsletter, so you can stay informed about webinars just like these. If you don't know where there are, they're on those different websites. There's some different um, um, screenshots that kind of give you an idea of how you can subscribe for them, or you can just send us an email and we can make sure that you are subscribed. And of course, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and a lot of other platforms. Just as Denny mentioned, this was part one. So part two is scheduled in a few weeks for August 31st. It will be a Wednesday at the same time of 7 p.m. So if you enjoyed this, we hope for you to come back. I'll make sure that the link to register for that will be available in the email that I send out tomorrow. Um, but anyone who is already, you know, automatically, you know, emailed on this as well too, I'll subscribe you as well too, just to, you know, in case you don't get a chance to register in that time. I also want to let people know about some things that are happening in the local area. If you are in the Philadelphia area or New Jersey, New York, or you're just looking to do something with Macrobotic Individual and you've been a longtime supporter of SHI, this is our 20th anniversary. For some of you who've been on our conferences and previous webinars, you'll know that this is our 20th celebration. So just next month and about a little bit over a month and a couple of weeks, we'll be doing an in-person celebration in the Philadelphia area at the Ethical Society. And it's gonna be an amazing event. As I mentioned, the 17th of September, which is a Saturday, is gonna be one through 5 p.m. We invite as many people that want to help to celebrate the success that SHI has been able to have over these many, many years to come out in person. We're going to have macrobiotic food that's prepared by Susan Waxman, as well as some of our volunteers and staff. And it's going to be an amazing opportunity just to connect with, you know, old friends, new friends, and just to learn about some of the comings of what's happening with SHI. So I'll make sure to include a link for that if you want to be able to take part and, you know, to be able to register for that event. Um, also, too, we will be having another conference coming up this fall. Our fall macrobiotic conference will be November 5th through the 6th, you know, 2022. So in a couple of months or so, of course, Denny and Susan are going to be there. Uh, but then some other names such as Dr. T. Colin Campbell, you know, Stephen Acock. We're going to also have An Hong Nguyen, who's a meditation and mindfulness practitioner, um, as well as, you know, an array of so many other presenters as well, too. Um, some individuals that are going to be familiar from some of our previous conferences. But some of that information is going to be present on our website in the links that I send tomorrow. And we're having a special, special early bird price that um, is going to end a couple of weeks that will be on the website, as I mentioned before as well, too, and included in those links that I mentioned. Um, just stay connected. We have a variety of courses that individuals can participate at the beginner level, at the advanced level. We have a new counselor training program that we're hoping, not hoping, but that we'll be launching in the coming year in spring of 2022. So keep an eye out for that information as well, too. You know, share a blog, share a recipe, share the book, just as Denny said. We have all sorts of free resources that you can find on our website. So many different things that you can give to individuals that are just looking to learn um, and also share webinars like this that we have once a month that are free. Um, and also lastly, these webinars, any of our presentations that we have would not be possible without the contributions of individuals like you. You know, these webinars, these conferences, so many things have been able to allow for SHI to stay afloat, to be able to celebrate those 20 years. Um, and we always let them let people know that we're trying to continue to grow. Right now, SHI is just a small organization of, you know, Denny, Susan, myself, and a few volunteers. And, you know, your support means a lot in making sure that we're able to sustain ourselves for another 20 years and beyond and spreading that mission that I had mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar. So we want to just say thank you. Um, and now for anyone who wants to just, you know, give their thanks to Denny again, um, feel free to unmute yourself. You can throw it in the chat and we appreciate you for taking part in this webinar tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you, Danny. Wonderful. As usual. You're, God you're bless. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. And to Susan, love. <laughs> thanks, Denny. Yeah. Excellent. Inspiring. Thank you, Karan, giving us all that support. Good night. You're welcome, Carol. Absolutely. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Take care.